Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the, at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for helping us better understand this intersection and leaning into the LGBTQ experience. If you are watching on a video version of this podcast, we invite you to participate in the live chat. The live chat is always open for those who want to share their thoughts and feelings about this episode and follow along as we premiere this episode. The cool part about it is you're able to interact with those who are watching this in real time. And if you are listening on an audio version of the podcast, we invite you to subscribe to this channel wherever you do catch your favorite audio podcasts. And while you subscribe to the channel, if you'll also leave us a rating, it will help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community by allowing episodes like this to gain a wider and more broad reach. Again, if you uh, follow us on any of our platforms, we are social media friendly. So we invite you to like, subscribe, share, share, share episodes just like this. This episode and others are available online as well at LatterGayStories.org. And you can watch every one of our Latter Gay Stories episodes as videos on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com backslash ladder gay stories. So again, we thank you for having a, uh, for giving an hour of your time to uh, experience another ladder gay stories story. So this one, I'm always excited to share uh, the indiv- individual stories. And I want to welcome to the podcast, David Doyle. David is uh, a gay man from Florida. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Excited to have you here. Um, 51 years old, an active Latter Day Saint. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. You're also a prolific blogger uh, with a uh, presence online, and we're going to talk uh, a lot about that. You've, you have a fascinating story. Sometimes when we talk about active Latter-day Saints who al- also were gay, um, who decide to invest into both identities, both as a, a gay person and a Latter-day Saint, sometimes people will just switch off the conversation because um, of, for a variety of reasons, but often people just don't believe someone like David Doyle can exist. And that's probably one of the reasons why I am so fascinated to have this discussion with you today, Um, mainly because you're not only living proof that that those two identities and those, um, those, sometimes we call them differing dichotomies, can actually harmoniously work together. So we're going to talk a lot about about that in your story today. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about um, your interaction with general authorities because that also plays into uh, your story. You currently have a state calling. Yes. And with that state calling comes interaction with church leaders. That's true. So we want to talk a little bit about the the church leaders, um, your life, your story. But I want the audience to really get to know uh, David Doyle for who David is. Well, thank you. I hope I hope that they uh, get that chance. <laughs> Let's do it. So... I often begin the podcast episodes with kind of the Genesis, chapter one, and in the beginning there was. At what point did David realize, I'm different? Um, Well, my queerness has always been there. I just didn't recognize it. It's been there since I was little. Um, Often little boys, as they are growing up, they get this idea that when they grow up, they're going to marry their mommy, like as they, as they have that concept of what marriage is. And of course, I didn't have the idea that men could marry, but somehow me and dad were going to be together one day. Um, when I was in kindergarten, there was a little girl named Winnie who, always, who really liked me and wanted to hold my hand when we were walking in the hallways. And I, I did not get why this was a thing for her. And, uh, and then as I got older, my friends started uh, like hyperventilating hyperventilating over girls and I, I just wasn't having those kind of feelings. And, and, um, as with the onset of puberty comes, uh, you know, like, uh, explicit dreams at night and in my dreams would be men, males. And, uh, that, that's when I first started figuring out something's different. I thought something was wrong or broken because that's not, I've never heard of this happening before. So that's the, that's the start of that, that realization. About what age were you when that started happening? Those, those dreams and the, the realization that I'm not, I don't want to say wired, but sometimes we just don't have the language for 
we don't have the language to describe what we're feeling. Maybe because of our upbringing, religious upbringing, something we don't talk about often. But at, at what age did that happen for you? Uh, well, the dream started, I, I don't know for sure, around age 13, 14. And uh, I only knew the word gay from primary songs. And some of the kids would snicker. And I didn't understand what was funny about that. Uh, uh, but as, so as a, I was born in 1970, so the 80s were my teenage years. And as the decade went on, uh, that's AIDS made the news and there were marches and stuff. And so the only thing I knew about people like me is that they died from a disease and that they, that they were marching and that, and I always heard jokes about gay people. So that's all I knew. And that was really scary to think I might be one of those people. And your family, were they active Latter-day Saints? Were you raised in a, in a family? Yes. My mom and dad met at BYU, <laughs> grew up in the church, hit, did all the milestones, uh, baptized, went on mission, went to the church schools in Rexburg and Provo. So how much of this topic was discussed at home? Uh, not at all. And um, in, in those days, I didn't know anyone who was gay. Like people didn't come out in high school. Uh, the only, the only thing, the only time that I can remember it being talked about was every year we read a pamphlet called uh, "To Young Men Only" by Boyd, Boyd Packer, I believe it was, right. and uh, that uh, I hated that Sunday every year. Uh, one year, the young men in my quorum starts start chanting "Smear the queer, smear the queer," and I knew I'm the one that's getting smeared. If they only knew, right, that it's not, it's kind of scary to, to a place that is your home and your community, as you start seeing you are really on the outsides when you thought you were deeply on the inside. Yeah, to young men only was pretty pivotal for a lot of people. Uh, the talk was given in 1976 in the October General Conference of, of the church. Uh, and it was uh, a priesthood session talk given by Boyd K. Packer. And among um, the notorious uh, little factory uh, <laughs> discussion came out of that to young men only talk. Um, but also uh, President Packer discussed the uh, story about a gay missionary whose companion came out to him and his companion decked him and um, beat him up. And Boyd K. Packer said what well, was better that the companion did it than an, than an apostle. So it really had some pretty difficult and negative connotations to uh, those who were still hiding in the closet. It was a, a, an opportunity to stay hidden still, uh, knowing that even an apostle uh, wasn't as favorable. But there was, there was plenty of religious shame that was hidden in that, uh, what eventually became the little booklet, the mm -hmm. To Young Men Only booklet. Thank you for providing the, 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 the you know, the, the I'm trying to think of the right word, but uh, describing, so I described my reaction to it, but I didn't explain what I was reacting to. So thank you for providing that. Yeah, we have a, a pretty diverse audience, many who actually aren't Latter-day Saints, um, who have religious, fundamental, uh, conservative religious backgrounds, who find this fascinating because we actually are having a topic about something that's been so taboo in their faith traditions. And so it's always good to give a little Mormon background. Mm -hmm. But even, I mean, to your point, even Latter-day Saints, Many don't know about to young men only because the church has now deleted that conference talk completely from its record. Mm -hmm. um, you can't even see that Boyd K. Packer was in the building in 1976 <laughs> just because they've scrubbed th that talk altogether. Um, but I, I think your story alone is evidence that, that the pain of that still exists and the memories of, of that talk uh, still exist. And it also is a testament uh, to show us to where we've come, uh, the progress that we have made since 1976 mm -hmm. on this topic. So it is interesting to me that, um, I, I was just curious what your family's uh, realm of discussion is, uh, was about, was there ever any discussion about sexuality in your home? You did mention the 80s, which was the height of the AIDS epidemic. And so in the secular version, the political version, I'm sure there was some discussion, but I was just curious what the family talked about. My family didn't talk about it at all. Uh, the only things I remember is, uh, my dad was a salesman, and I remember him coming home talking about uh, he was at the home of uh, a gay couple, and uh, like he 
he, when he shook their hands when he left, he, he made sure to go wash his hands immediately afterwards, and, and there were some jokes made. So those were the only, the only times the subject of homosexuality came up in my home. You move forward, I mean, progressing. You're talking right. at this point we're now 13, 14, 15 years old, but you now prepare for a mission. With that comes all of those feelings of inadequacy and worthiness um, issues. Did you feel worthy to serve a mission because you were gay or starting to have those uh, better understanding of who and what you were or are? That, um, I didn't think of it in terms of, am I worthy? I, I, there was an expectation that I would go on a mission and I wasn't sure if I should go on a mission. I. I I had a lot of questions that I didn't have answers to, and and the thought of going on a mission scared me. Um, my I, and I, you know, we're talking about my thinking back then. I thought that if you had a good excuse not to go on a mission, then that would be okay. But otherwise, you need to go. And uh, my bishop called me in and talked about starting the application paperwork. And he could tell I wasn't excited. And he told me to go home and pray about the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and the church. And that it's often at this point in a young person's life that, that, the, that things get very real and they need to know answers because they're, they're about to commit a major chunk of life to this. And so I went home and I prayed, but not about those things. I, um, I asked God if he loved me, all of me, if he could love who I am and what I am. And that, I'm sorry, that's as far as I got in the prayer. And just like waves of warmth radiated across my body. And I, I felt I heard the message, you are not broken. And that sustained me for a long time but I look back now and I think it's really sad that somebody grew up in this church and went to primary junior Sunday school the youth programs didn't know if God could love them that's that's really that's really tragic to me where did you uh, serve where were you called to serve oh I went to South Korea Culture is different in South Korea than it is in the United States. Yes, it's uh, it's still a very uh, conservative culture, but um, uh, in Korea, holding hands is a, a friendship thing. So men and men hold hands, women and women hold hands. So that was not that I'm trying, not that I was trying to express my sexuality while I was a missionary, but there was some comfort in being able to hold a man's hand. And uh, as the missionaries, we worked together in pairs and we often, Korea is expensive, so we often lived together in two pairs or four pairs together. So I got to develop very um, close relationships with men and they weren't sexual, they weren't, you know, they weren't romantic, but um, that, that, um, that helped me as I was developing to, to see, I mean, because I think homosexuality is not just about sex, it's about who you bond with. And so I bond easily with men. And so that was a, a, a good time for that. Did you ever have discussions with your companions about sexuality or ever, I know you come out, we'll get to that part of the story where you come out later in life, uh, <laughs> were there ever those opportunities you're like, this is my chance, or this is, <laughs> this is a time to be able to share more about who I am? One time. Um, my, my first companion, um, I was in the kitchen, it was my turn to cook breakfast and I was chopping up onions and the, the onions were making me cry. And I went into the bedroom where my companion was studying and I said, I need to tell you something, I'm gay. And I know it was a joke, I wouldn't make that joke today, but he like got deadly serious and are you serious? We need to call the mission president. And I was like, no, 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 no. Cause, um, like I wouldn't have been able to serve at that time if I was out as gay and I've already, I've already decided to do this and invest this time. And so I immediately backed off of that, of that uh, suggestion.
I think you bring up a good point too. The, the church did discourage um, not only coming out, but missionaries who did identify who or had come out were prohibited from serving missions. But it was a way to test the water of how he reacted. And, and based on his reaction, I, I, I backed off. Any remarkable stories throughout your mission? Um, did you teach anybody that identified uh, along the spectrum? Any, any stories that you remember from that time that pertain to the topic? Um, South Korea is much more conservative on queer topics than the United States is. It's, it's much further behind. It's, it's coming along, but at that time, uh, I had Koreans that told me that there were no gay Koreans and that the only that if there were any gay Koreans, they hung out around the American military bases because there were gay military men from America. It was the mil military men who were infiltrating Korea. Right, yes. This is definitely an American-born problem. Uh, so you end up leaving uh, the mission, and typically for a young man who uh, honorably completes their mission, they go home and begin the arduous task of dating uh, and for Wilford Woodruff and other church apostles, they were engaged within four to nine days of them coming home from their mission. Uh, did that happen to you? Were you a prolific dater? What was life like <laughs> post-mission? Uh, well, I pretty quickly went to the church school in Rexburg, Idaho, which is pretty small. And uh, the, I I had my roommate, he was very handsome, the 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 ladies in the ward called him Ken because they made him think of the Ken doll, Barbie and Ken. And they were very interested in dating him. And uh, so he got asked out often, which is kind of backwards from our culture. Usually men ask women, but they were very interested in him. And they usually had, they were nervous just to do it. And so they had their roommate to ask me out. So the only dates I went on were where I got asked out and I got to go with my friend. And so if the date didn't go well, I still have my friend that I could talk with. And what was dating like? Because, I mean, I mean, full being candid and honest here, you're still very closeted, still but coherent and well aware of how you're wired. Um, but also the great Mormon message at the time was mi mission, marriage, children. You serve a mission, you get married in the temple and have children, and this goes away. <laughs> Yes. Well, I, well, I had that message that I wasn't broken, so I didn't think I was going to change. And, uh, I, you know, denial is a powerful thing. So I, also I knew like clearly I was in the closet. And so I thought I'm at, uh, I'm at school to study and get a degree. So keep your head down and just do the thing. Um, the big surprise was uh, at the end of the semester, my roommate came out to me as bi and we were best friends. And I mean, it's the very end of the semester, like reading days and finals. And so for a couple days, our, our relationship changed and it felt like boyfriend, boyfriend. And I, th I thought for the first time, I thought this is my chance at happiness. And I would go to sleep and I would think about, we're going to have to transfer schools. I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to have to say goodbye to my family. This is 1993. Uh, I, I knew in order to have to live that life, I had to completely cut off the, the life I had been living. The two weren't compatible in any way in my head. But uh, it's strange that my first experience with romance was at the church school with my first roommate. In Rick's, at Rick's College in yes. Rexburg. That's amazing. <laughs> but you're not the only one. We've had plenty of guests here who uh, found their beginnings in Rexburg, Idaho. Well, and I... I, I need to tell you that story it didn't end well. Uh, my roommate felt uh, guilty that we were that we were having this kind of relationship, and so he went and told the bishop, who then came and saw me, and we were split up. And I asked my roommate why he did that, and he said life would be easier if he married a woman. And and he's it's true, it's correct, but uh, I was. 
I felt like he betrayed me because he didn't talk to me. He went and talked to a bishop and got me in trouble. Uh, and, and so I resolved to remain firmly in the closet. Like I stepped back in and it's not that I had done anything really wrong. I was put on probation for a couple of weeks and, and until like my roommate left and it was just me and, and they were like, he's fine. And, and then they made me an elders quorum president after that. So, you know, so how many years was it from that experience to the time that you actually said, I'm going to do this for real. I'm coming out. Oh, okay. So as I was, so it was a long time, actually. Um, I was approaching 40 and I thought, what's the point of having a life if you're never going to live? And I resolved to come out and I knew it was well past time to come out. And uh, what I didn't know then is I have a social anxiety disorder and it was, it had been festering for decades. So it had gotten very strong and I just couldn't make like a big announcement. And so I, I made some steps. Like if somebody said, why aren't you dating? Or they wanted to set me up with somebody or why aren't you married? I would respond to those and come out in those situations. So like if they tried to set me up with somebody, I'd say, does she have a brother, you know, and, and just slowly one by one, I was coming out and, um, it doesn't take long before you lose control of the story and other people start telling other people. And, and after a while, people are coming up to you and saying, I heard you're gay. And I'm like, how did you hear? I didn't say anything to you. So, well, you tried to date my brother. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but you know, the good thing about it is I, there's a certain dissonance that I had uh, always felt between who I felt I was on the inside and how I presented myself. And that started to go away, even though I was only telling a few people at a time. And I felt a lot more confident about myself. And I think other people noticed because I started getting promotions at work. And uh, <laughs> in church, my calling had always been church primary pianist. And, and uh, my callings changed after I started coming out, even though a lot of the leaders didn't know, but they, something about me their perception of me changed. And I think that's because my perception of myself changed. Do you, was that like your perception of authenticity? Like you were able to finally be your true self? Like you were finally able to show the world who you were? Um, was, yes, do you think was, that was part of that countenance? I think so. And it was baby steps, but it was progress for the first time in decades. Yeah, that's exciting. Like I, I'm, my heart just kind of swells. My little Grinch heart swells two or three sizes when I hear stories like that because it, that's what it's all about. Like, that's the important part of coming out. That's the beauty of authenticity and honesty and being able to be comfortable in your own skin. Being able to, like, if we want to talk about living to the fullest measure of, of our creation, that is that very still, small voice that you heard so many years earlier. Mm -hmm. David, you're not broken. Mm -hmm. You're perfect the way you are. I think that's just beautiful in its, in its simplicity. Well, I was always gay and, and people didn't know that, but they loved me and I was gay even if they didn't know. And so my hope was knowing more about myself, they could accept me because they already had accepted me. Um, that wasn't always, some people backed off, but um, I can't control how they react, you know. So me going forward was progress for me. Let's talk about your trajectory forward. You come out and realize that the sky doesn't fall. That, yes. That the people actually are um, forgiving and sympathetic and empathetic and loving and kind. And you mentioned some people do walk away also. Um, what was your hope? What did you hope the world could see and learn and benefit from? I... At that time, I hadn't thought that deeply about it. Um, it was just a first step for me. It, it was a scary step for me. And, and just worrying about that was, was big enough. I, I did worry if my church leaders would, um, would react negatively and somehow that affect my membership. Um, so I didn't actually tell any of the leaders, but some of them, it got around, you know, uh, but, uh, I, I actually didn't tell my family. I assumed my family, I assumed my family probably knew by that point. Uh, and you know, it, 
coming out is a risk. And I, I didn't want to risk losing my family. So I convinced myself that they probably already knew. And my family doesn't discuss hard things usually. And so I just let that part lie for a while. I'm curious about chronology um, in, as it relates to church history. Because you lived through the early 70s, which was that Kimball mm-hmm. uh, Packer era. Um, and we all know that the church was not very favorable to the queer community in that era. The 80s, as you mentioned earlier in the interview, brought out the AIDS epidemic. And um, socially and politically, there were plenty of discussions back and forth. Um, the later 80s brought out, especially in Florida, Anita Bryant and so much of what was going on. Um, in that area uh, with the radicalization of heterosexuality and the the, just the sheer hate that came out of social groups uh, against the queer community but our own faith community our own church um, i'm now thinking forward to like 2015 when the policy of exclusion comes out um and you mentioned many times about the importance of hanging on to your callings and, and, and we're going to get into your interview a little later about your relationship with the church, but that had to have been a gut punch, uh, November, 2015, when the church then, uh, labels its queer members as apostates and ready for excommunication. Yes. I, I want to take one step back, um, talking about history. And so the church had a lot of, of theories of why people were gay. And I had a, a bishop who I had not come out to, but he had figured out I'm gay. And so he told me that if you have enough faith, then you, you won't be gay. And that was uh, really a harmful teaching for me because uh, I could never be faithful enough, no matter, no matter how much I tried, no matter what I did, I, I couldn't prove to God enough that that I was worthy to be fixed. Uh, I mean, this is before I had my own answer, but uh, those kind of messages are very harmful. But skipping ahead to 2015, so I was the Stick Young Men president at the time, and uh, earlier that year, there was a gay marriage had become legal, and I was very happy about that, but the first presidency had put out a, a letter to be read in all the, in all the, branches and wards, all the congregations. And my state president had me accompany him to several of the wards where this letter was read. And I heard people that I know speak in such fear and misunderstanding and bigotry about people like me. And I know not, I know many of them didn't know I was gay, but some did. And only one person out of three wards said anything positive. That I knew a lot of people had issues, but that was the time that I saw a depth, the depth in how widespread that was. And then moving forward to November, the church put out a policy that excluded the children of, a gay, of anyone who's in a gay relationship. And, and gay couples were uh, t- labeled apostate. And, and that was really hard for me. And I... Um, I was in my room, I was yelling at God, like, why did you let me see in this church, which clearly doesn't want me? And all this time, like you could have given me a message to leave and get out. And um, uh, I got the answer that it's fine to leave. It is fine to leave. But if you're willing to stay, there's a work for you to do. And um, I wasn't done being mad at God. And I said, you can't just say there's a special work. I don't, like, that doesn't mean anything. Like I can't weigh that against the cost to stay. And so I feel like I was given four specifics that I would get to talk to the youth of my stake about being an LGBTQ member. I would get to help leaders better understand. I would help queer Mormons learn to accept and love themselves. And I would get to share my story. And all four of those things have come to be. I think we should explore those. 
Okay. I, I would, yeah, because I think those are all fascinating. I, I know there's a segment of this population who's listening to this episode waiting to pounce on this idea that you you can't be gay and Mormon at the same time. Why is why does David feel compelled to stay in the church? And so I want to talk about the church aspect of it, but I also want to talk about um, what you're doing outside of the church um, publicly, social on social media, and how that has been able to influence your testimony and your ability to live. Um, not straddling both worlds, but fully engulfed in both. Okay. Um, well, I thought I I thought long and hard about that uh, offer. I, I feel like it was a choice I was given, and I. It's not that the church would change, but I felt like this would be an important step in helping hearts to soften and, and increase understanding. And I thought that's something I want to be a part of. And I, I made the decision to, ch- to stay. And um, within two weeks, I was released as stake human president and called as the stake executive secretary. And um, I was actually pretty ticked about that because I thought me and God had a deal. I didn't understand this new calling would help that other special work happen. And so I know some people are fascinated. They want to talk to me about being a stake executive secretary. I do that calling and I do my best at it, but that's not what's important to me. What's important is that allows this other work to happen. And so like I have gotten to speak to the youth of my stake. I've been asked to speak at stake youth firesides and, and I deliver a message to queer youth who may be there. I, um, I've been involved in a lot of the stake youth activities. They like to have me around youth. I'm asked to come talk to wards about uh, ward youth, about being more welcoming and accepting. So that's happened. Um, talking about helping leaders understand. I thought that meant I would talk to ward young men leaders or bishops. But now that I was in meetings at the stake presidency, when, when general authorities come for state conference or for other reasons, I'm in the room. I soon learned they ex- kind of exist in a bubble. They show up at a new place and they basically just meet the stake presidency or maybe their spouses. And then they talk to everyone else, but that's the only people they really interact with behind the scenes. And it's, they kind of run into the same people everywhere they go until they come to my stake. And here's this gay man and they have to interact with me. And, and uh, so there's that. And, and let's see the, the third is I have a blog. I had a blog that existed before that, and I just named it after. I just described myself at, so as nerdy gay Mormon, and I basically write about my own thoughts and experiences and things that are hard and things that are difficult. And think, I want to be very affirming because I don't feel like there's a lot of affirming messages. There's a lot of rejecting messages, and a lot of people find me there and, and contact me there. And, Yes, and then I'm on a podcast today sharing my story. So that's all four of them right there. Uh, so I want to break all these down. Um, and for the sake of the audience, we're not going to talk about your podcast episode because, hi, you're in the thick of it. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to talk about um, two of them that I think are super fascinating, and that is the messages that you're able to give to the youth as you speak to them um, in these words and branches. I, I'm, I'm really curious as to the outline. Like, what are you actually talking to the youth about um, from a very affirming, because I know you well enough to know that you aren't going to give them the ultra 50 North Temple conservative Orthodox Mormon <laughs> answers to this topic. And so I'm curious as to what you are discussing um, in regards to sexuality in these Mormon circles with the youth. Uh, the second part of that, I'm interested in a very similar vein, what you're actually saying uh, and the responses you're getting with the general authorities. Okay, so if I'm asked to speak in a church setting, I'm not the apostles. They, I'm not the one that gets to decide what is acceptable in this church. Um, in church, that, that, that's what the teachings are. So I don't, um, I don't challenge those. But what, what I will say is, that uh, so I will tell them that they are loved and that they aren't broken and, and don't need to be fixed and that they have some very tough choices to make and whether those choices keep them in the church or out of the church, they still can walk with God and they still can know that they are loved and um, that if a time comes where they want to come back, 
they're welcome to come back, but it's their, it's their journey and they have to work that out with God because they're the ones that have to live it. In your interactions with general authorities, do they recognize that there's an LGBTQ issue between theology and reality? <laughs> so, um, when I meet them at state conference, we get some interaction, and then uh, several of them have invited me to meet with them when I come to Utah. And so, when I'm with them in their office here in, in Salt Lake City, we get to have much more candid, in-depth uh, conversations. And they, I don't know that they would put it the way that you did. They would instead say that they realize that there's a struggle, that this is not difficult, that what is asked is, is doesn't seem fair uh, unless you have an eternal perspective. So they frame it differently, but I think that you're, they're getting at the same thing that you're trying to say. Yeah, just the variation of a sacred theme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Consider the lilies. That's, a, that's an ode to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Yeah, it's, it, it is fascinating to me just because I, I do think that sometimes we get lost in this. Um, maybe we call it lost in translation. We, we really are speaking a, a very similar language, especially among Latter-day Saints and post-Mormons, uh, ex-Mormons, who are um, really honestly, I think at the end of the day, is searching for the very same thing. We want um, our people to be happy and healthy. And, and really one of the points of this podcast, one of my personal goals is just to help people fall out of the closet in a healthy way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not interested in whether you stay in the church or leave the church. I'm more interested in, in that when you fall out of the closet, we fall out in a healthy way that allows you to not be broken, that fewer bones, fewer bruises, fewer disruptions in your life happen so that you can stand up, breathe, kick the dust off your shoes a little bit, and then thrive. And whether that takes you back in the church, away from the church, or nowhere close to a church again, that's not my concern. My, my concern is the wasted bandwidth that we go through in triage, mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. trying to keep people alive and trying to keep people healthy and happy. And, and so I'm just curious, like, um, in, in the things that you're able to do, how do we do it as Latter-day Saints? How, mm -hmm. how do we avoid that destruction? Both cause, and I, I say that destruction because I think that destruction is, is self-destruction, but it's also institutional dis, uh, destruction, that there are multiple facets here. It, I, I think this question is difficult because you're asking me what can we as a church do? I, I can't tell you what, I can't say, I can't speak for what the church can do. Um, some of the teachings of the church are very, um, I think, are very harmful. I mean, the idea that only certain people get to go to go to the highest level of heaven, and that gay people don't get to go there, and and you're separated from your family not like for fifty years or a hundred years, but forever, forever for something that you didn't choose and and can't uh, can't change. That's a really that's a really rejecting message. Um, so there's those big kind of things, but then there's small things. So it really hurts me when I find out that somebody's gone to my stake president and said, hey, did you know your, your secretary's gay? And he's very good about it. He'll say, uh, yes, and, and what else? You know, but they think just because I'm gay that I automatically am not worthy or I automatically shouldn't be in any kind of position of influence. So those are very hurtful to me too. Um, we get way more rejecting messages than we ever do affirming or positive messages at church. And that's, that is a big problem. Years ago, I heard Ben Shalati talk to a group of Latter-day Saints who um, lamented that the church lacked resources for its members to better understand this topic. And I think Ben answered it in a super positive and uh, insightful way. He looked around the audience and he said, you are the resources. That's beautiful. You know, when somebody stands up in a, in a church meeting and says something positive in, in, in response to like negative things that have been said, that really, that really touches my heart. And it also gives me a rest because I'm the only one there usually that will say anything. And sometimes I just don't have the spoons to do it, you know. I fully understand that. 
that leads me into um, your blog and uh, your Tumblr blog, uh, Nerdy <laughs> yes. Gay Mormon, yes. the things that you're doing there. Um, that probably gives you an opportunity to interact with Latter-day Saints um, who often are closeted, who aren't out um, to their sometimes friends, their own family members, but particularly their own church family. What is that interaction like? And, and what are you seeing um, from the front lines? So Tumblr has a feature where people can submit a, a, a direct message to you. They, they, we, we call them ask because they're usually questions and they can do so anonymously. So I feel like I'm the deer and landers, you know, of, uh, of queer stake in that uh, all these people write to me anonymous questions and, and uh, I respond by posting an answer on, on my blog. Uh, I was just counting the other day. Um, I've, I've, I've responded to over 1,600 of these since 2017. So there's a lot and they keep coming. Um, I, I find a lot of people want to talk to somebody who's in church, an adult, but they don't feel safe to do that at their own ward or to their own family. And um, um, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. I wish that people, I wish that parents were the kind of parents that when their kid gets in trouble, they go, or they have a deep question, they're like, oh no, I need to talk to dad. Instead of, oh no, I hope dad doesn't find out. Right, they need, they need home to be a place of love and safety and dependability, no matter what else is going on in their life. What other questions, I mean, if you were to say like the top three questions that you get out of those 1600 plus, <laughs> is, there a, is there a generalization, um, kind of a natural theme that you see over and over and over again? I get asked many times, probably the number one question I get is, why are you still a Mormon? Um, I get asked, uh, how does God love me? Can God love me as a queer person? And, and then uh, the other one I get asked a lot is, I want to express myself as a queer person, but not get in trouble with church and my family. And so what are things I can do to help me affirm myself while I'm in a space where I don't feel safe to really be out yet. I think it's a, those are all three great. So I'm going to borrow them. <laughs> okay. David, why are you still a Mormon? <laughs> well, uh, I feel like in 2015, Jesus personally invited me to stay in this church. And so whatever else other people say, I got Je Jesus has my back. And um, I don't know that this special work is going to last forever, right? So at some point that will have to be revisited, but that's why I'm here now. Does God love his queer Latter-day Saints? Absolutely. In, in or out of the church? No question. God loves all of us. So I don't know why we try to put quantifiers on that and try to box in who God loves and who God doesn't. God's love is so expansive and so in, enveloping. I'm curious about what your message would be. So that a lot of those interactions are with um, queer people themselves. Yes. I'm curious um, how much interaction you have or what your message would be to parents of queer kids. Um, and maybe even particularly the uh, Latter-day Saint parents of queer kids. Kind of building upon what Ben Shalati had talked about, we know that the church is really shy on resources for this topic, especially on how to better minister to their own um, LGBTQ friends and family members. So you being a resource, um, what, what would your advice be to these latter families, these Latter-day Saint families who have kids that come out who recognize that their policy, the church's policy, and, and what you hear over the church's pulpit doesn't match what they're looking at or seeing over the kitchen table. Their son, their daughter, their children are not all the things that the church taught them to expect from this topic. What would your message be to those families? Well, first, I want to give a shout out to Ben Shalati. I've never met him. I don't know him. But he, he does a work that is easily accessible and, and understood by parents and by those who are not queer. And that's an important thing. I, I don't have that many non-queer people contact me. I do have parents once in a while. And uh, usually they, they come along and say, 
my kid can't have church and love both. That's been like, those have been the two most important things in my life. How can they, how can they have to choose? Like, and I'm like, I know it sucks. I, I'm glad that you now are seeing that this is a dilemma that, that is really terrible. Sometimes they come to me and say, I, how do I get my kid to stay in church? Or I wish my child was more like you and wanted to be in church. And, um, th that breaks my heart. And I, I will say something like, <laughs> Love the child you have, not the child you, you think you deserve or that you wish you had. You need to be the parent your child needs, not wish for the child you wish that uh, would be easier for you. You know, it's not about your comfort. And the other thing I think is you look at me and you see, oh, there's this person at church. He makes it work. This is doable. They never ask, what is your life like? What, what is life like for a queer person in church who's active? It's, I don't, it's not the kind of life they chose for themselves. And it comes at a high cost. I've gone to therapy because I was suicidal. I, have low, I worked really hard on low self-esteem and, and internalized homophobia. And, and I, I have an anxiety disorder and, and so on and so on. And it comes at a high cost. And... Um, I wonder if that's really what people are wishing on the people they love. I don't think they've thought it through that much. I think that's beautiful. I also think uh, you bring up a really important point about uh, pedestals and platforms. I never want anyone to say, I want to, here's David's story, I want you to hear it, because David's in the church, and I, th I think you should learn about, it's okay to learn David's complex story and that, the, and that there's a lot to this more than I understood, but not you are gay, and so I want you to hear about a gay person that stayed in church. You should find out from them what their wishes and what their desires are in life and support them in, in the good things that they want to accomplish in their life. And if that's remaining in church, great. Then let's talk about how to deal with rejecting messages and building resilience and developing a, their own relationship with God so they get their own personal revelation and can figure out their own path forward. But don't use me to tell other people what to do. Why is that problematic? And, and why do you think Mormon culture has perpetuated that? I think um, parents are scared because we, we talk about the eternal family and we talk about no empty chairs in heaven and um, a child coming out doesn't fit the narrative that uh, parents have in their head of what should be and it throws them for a loop. And out of that fear, rather than stepping into it and saying, I need to enlarge my understanding and enlarge my heart, they say, this is where the line is. How do I pull my child back in so I don't lose them? Uh, uh, anyone who has a queer child is going to go on quite a journey. And, but, you know, the thing is, all children go on a journey and do not live up to all their parents' expectations. But I find... I, it's a little surprising to me, but I've heard enough parents say it that when when they have a queer child, they go through a mourning process because they imagine their child getting married in the temple and doing certain things, and that's not going to happen. And and the loss of that dream, they grieve that. But to me, it's sort of silly because that dream was never going to be a reality. They're mourning something that never was going to happen. I think that's a really profound point. And I wish that was a point that I, that I wish more Latter-day Saints would pick up some, and, and I deal with this so much in this space as well. This, um, the grieving process, mourning the loss of the celestial kingdom, the, the idea that just like you talked about the, the no empty chairs in heaven, there are families who have to mourn the loss of their son or daughter, not marrying someone of their opposite gender. You know, sometimes people, Sometimes our church leaders talk about, well, gay people, they're going to one of the lower kingdoms of heaven, and it's wonderful, and they'll be happy there, but we're going to talk about people that can be exalted. And everyone just goes along with it, like that's an acceptable cost. And how come no one ever goes, well, I guess we're all going to the lower kingdom with David because we love David. We want to be with David. And, and they hang out the family. I'm sorry. They hang out the family proclamation. Well, why don't they hang up a picture of their family, right? I'm not saying that everything in the proclamation is wrong, but it's been used really aggressively against queer people. I wish instead of talking about I, what ideal families 
look like? How about we talk about ideal family values, about kindness and love and acceptance and hard work and, and uh, inclusiveness and those kind of things. Can we just end the podcast there and say amen and amen? <laughs> amen yes. That was beautiful. Uh, I think we use this part of the podcast to talk about the future. What does the future look like for queer Mormons? From your pew. I, I don't know. Change. I, I used to, I still am convinced change is going to happen. Um, it just is happening so slowly. It, it makes me sad. What type of change do you think is going to happen? I think a lot of the restrictions that we put on queer people are not scriptural. And I think if we really believe the things that we teach from scriptures, that we will eventually have to undo all that and create true equality, not just for queer people, but for women, for people of color, for people with disabilities. God's not a respecter of anybody. God loves everybody. Um, treat others how you want to be treated. Uh, look at the fruits of the policies that we have in place and what doctrines we have in place. Sometimes we have doctrines masquerading as doc, I mean, policies masquerading as doctrine. And look at the fruit, look at the fruit of what we require of queer people in this church and, and what the fruits of that is. Most queer people leave. Do you know any queer comfort? There are a handful. They're like unicorns. So queer kids, they they hear leaders say there's a space for them in church, and then they look around and say, well, I don't see any queer adults. I don't see any queer leaders. Where's my place? Are you saying I'm second class, third class? Do you think the church fears? I, I think you bring up a really important point that I've not been able to fully wrap my brain around. Um, why, why the pews are void of queer voices? This, this choir, this chorus that we are, are so fond with in Mormonism that has a a variety of voices, not all the voices, but why is it that we are not seeing? Is the, does the church fear the queer couple in their congregation? Do they fear just the fact that we have queer people sitting in pews? That's the issue. I've wondered, is, is that the issue, or is it that the church fears that their narrative against queer people isn't sustainable because people do have happiness, joyful experiences, spirituality, while also marrying their same gender. I'm just curious what you think. I mean, obviously no wrong answers. I'm just wondering what your observation is. What does the church fear in having queer members, queer adults in those congregations? I, uh, that's a, I, I, I mean, I can make guesses. I can surmise things, but I don't really know. I think that having people there, it normalizes it. And, and um, even though some things in church have progressed, uh, a lot of people aren't aware of that progression and they are still stuck behind. Um, and uh, so it's hard to talk even about what current teachings and, and practices are in a church setting, because a lot of people will say, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I learned. Um, I, I will say if we can't attract queer adults to join, then it's not a good space. And, and, and until, you can, until we see an influx of queer converts, then you can just know that it's not a good place for queer people generally. And so it's not a surprise that almost all leave. There's something to be said, and we hear this often. Um, we're recording the interview in Utah, but you're from... Florida. Yes. Um, and when you live in Utah, everything outside of Utah is called the mission field. <laughs> and it's just this Mormon semantics. But you know, missionaries semantics. from Florida go to Utah. So to us, Utah's just as much a mission field as anywhere. We're not talking about what other, this is only Utah centric. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Um, but I wonder, like, is it easier to be a gay Mormon outside of Utah? I, as, I'm just thinking as you're talking and, and the culture and all the things that surround um, this topic, I, I'm just opining, just wondering, is it easier um, because the wards and branches are smaller in these areas outside of Utah that not only is the queer person needed, 
but the queer person is actually seen. And these branch presidents, these ward uh, bishops and, and stake leaders actually see the member and their goodness and the qualities that they bring to these congregations. And I'm always just curious um, where Utah's just so full already um, that it's easier to marginalize and make the congregations look the way we want them to look when in, in reality in some of these smaller congregations and smaller areas, they take everybody that they can get because they require um, such a, a group of people to support the, the units of the church. I, I don't know. Uh, my only experience with uh, Utah Mormonism was attending BYU. And so BYU wards are not like a regular family ward. It's a little weird to me that you, I mean, you know how much you interact with people in your own ward and then that's your neighborhood and, and you see each other at the grocery store and you know what you know who's buying at the convenience mart. Like, it's like living on top of each other to me. It's, it's strange. But uh, so in, in Florida, like, so one example I do know is different from visiting friends here is in Florida, we use a lot more singles in, uh, in callings, um, in state callings and ward callings than here. Um, my single friends here are like, what? I can't believe that uh, they're in the state primary presidency and, and whatever, whatever, right? And they're on the high council and in the bishopric. So, I, I, so perhaps it is true that uh, we give a wider variety of people an opportunity to serve. Which I think is ultimately a blessing. That, that's a benefit to Mormonism. And, and I think individually that, that gives people far more opportunity to be able to shine and to be able to serve. And you, you know, Kyle, I, I, I know I don't come across as a typical true believing member. And so I do have some differences, but I do love this community and this is my community. And um, I try to be authentic as a gay person and be out and be seen and enjoy things that that gay people do and I go to drag shows and I, I wear flashy clothes and, and you know, I, uh, like the stereotypes, right? But I'm also LDS, I'm as LDS as anybody and I, I have some differences but I try to be a good member and be a good follower of Christ and I, I, I can only give what I can give and give it in a way that works for me and, and that's what I try to do. I think, and I, I, I love it, it's exactly the reason why I wanted to have this episode. Um, I, I see your goodness, I see the impact that you're making um, in, in the world. I also see sometimes um, the difficult position that queer Latter-day Saints, gay Latter-day Saints are faced with. And that is this um, dichotomy of um, the world's perception that you must choose. And there are, there are, it was very interesting, I just read this the other day, that we shouldn't confuse queer Latter-day Saints of faith with faithful queer Latter-day Saints. That there was a big difference be between those two. And I thought that was actually quite profound. Mm -hmm. That sometimes um, within Mormonism, we label um, queer people by their faithfulness. They're a faithful Latter-day Saint. They are living the fullest measure of their creation or uh, according to the covenant path while there are other queer Latter-day Saints who also are in relationships with their same gendered spouses that are living faithful lives. And so we, we often want to separate those two when in reality we're, we are talking about the very same right. group of people. Um, so I, I already said before, I don't really like to talk about being a state executive secretary. Other people do. I, it doesn't really give me any more authority to talk about anything, but what it does do is it is, in our church, it serves as sort of shorthand to say, well, he must be living a certain way. And, and yes, that's what I'm choosing to do now. But uh, almost all of my queer friends from church have left and I still love them and we're still friends and we still interact and I still go hang out with them and they hang out with me. You know, we, we our similarities in experience and in what we want in life are actually very very similar. I, I want to be loved. I may not be pursuing that right now, but, uh, you know, that's a natural, normal thing to want. That's where I wanted to take the latter part of this podcast. What does the future look like for David Doyle? Oh, gosh. 
<laughs> so uh, I'm laughing because actually yesterday I was just over at, at, at the church campus a meeting with some of the leaders and and I got asked that very question like what is what's the rest of the life look like for David Doyle and his afterlife and my answer is I don't know and and it's really hard to project uh, if I stay on the current path I'm on I just see ever increasing loneliness my nieces and nephews are growing up and going to college and going on missions and getting married. And, you know, they are, their life is shifting to be more about them and, and building the life that they're going to have. And I'm still their fun uncle, but I don't get to be part of that life any, as much as I was. And, and, and so I don't know what my, I don't know the answers to those things. I hope that there's love, and I hope that there is um, peace. And uh, because I don't know, it's kind of scary to focus on those. So I choose to focus on now. I think I, I like to say God's doing work in the net. God is doing work in the world now, and how can I be a part of that? So I don't. I don't worry about the future. The future will have to take care of itself. You know, there's a parable of the laborer and, and these people get hired on at various parts of the day and, they, and they're told what wages will be, they will receive. And then there's a group at the very end who they are not given any explicit promises and they're just told, why are you hanging around? Come work. And they just hope for the best. They hope that the master is going to be fair to them. And, and that's, the, that's the most, I, that's where I feel like I am at. I have none of the promises that other members of the church have. I don't have the same blessings offered to me. I'm sort of at a dead end on, you know, we talk about the covenant path. I'm on a dead end. I don't get to complete that. But knowing my relationship with God in Christ, I believe they will be fair to me. What did you want the listeners and viewers of this podcast episode to take away from your story? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think two things. One, um, people's lives are complex. And so, so yes, I, you can look at members of the church who are active, but, that, but there's likely a lot more to the story than that. And the other thing is parents need to love their children. You're, they're your children. You've been entrusted with them. You need to measure up and be parents who help them know how help them love themselves and and be good people and be kind and work hard and be ready for the world and to do good in the world beautiful all of it thank you what did we not talk about that you wanted to talk about was there anything that you wanted to expand on or wanted to say um so uh we we sort of mentioned that i get to talk with general authorities once in a while that uh I, so I, you know, if you're online, you have people that come after you. I've had many people come after me. I've had web spaces that have tracked what I, what I post and reported each other and, and to each other about what I'm doing and stuff. And it's, it's kind of frightening to, to come across these sites and see how people are, are reacting to me and think that me simply having a calling at church is dangerous. But they don't see how general authorities interact with me. They are very kind and loving. Um, when we have conversations, that they're willing to say, I don't know, or I hope this, or I'm not sure. This is what we teach, but I got to believe this is going to happen for you. So uh, I, I find them much more... Um, when they interact with me on a personal basis, they they can feel the, they can feel the struggle and and it feels like they want to help resolve that, but they don't have all the tools that they can to do so. But I think the difference of how church leaders treat me and how these other people treat me that are scared of queer people, and if they could only see how how their heroes treat someone like me, maybe they would change and do better. I like it. I love it. David, thank you. Can you believe we already went through an hour? 
<laughs> it feels very long to me, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I appreciate you, Kyle. You do a lot of good work, and uh, I feel like you, you are very fair to your guests, and I feel like you were fair with me. Thank you. I, I, I hope that nobody... Thank you. Uh, my intent is to allow people to share their story exactly where they're at. And I think, um, and I've said this over and over and over again, there is more than one way to gay. And there is far more than one way to Mormon. And we've highlighted on this podcast so many different variety, uh, uh, varieties of stories in an effort for those who watch and interact with these episodes to see somebody who represents them and to be able to see somebody that they can, they can hold on to and say, that's how I feel. That's a little bit about me. And just like we talked about early on, um, but not say, this is how I have to be. This is the pedestal I have to be set upon. This is the expectations that, I, that are required of me if I am going to become more active in the church or fall away from the church. If you if they if someone wants to remain in the church, I want to walk with them and help them along and have them help me. If if they want to if they decide leaving the church is better for them, I am cheering them on. I want them to have a happy, healthy, whole life. And if they feel they need to find that outside the church, I want them to find that. I was in a panel today um, moderated by a lady named Laura Skaggs, who I really love. She's a therapist, and and we had people at different points of their faith journey. And she made the point, was Moses righteous when, when he was talking to Pharaoh and, def, and, and saying, hey, we got problems here? Was Moses righteous when he was standing up to Pharaoh and, and bringing on the plagues? Was Moses righteous when he took people who were being hurt out of those situations? Moses was righteous at all those points. And so whether it's someone like me who is in the church trying to build understanding, whether it's someone saying, hey, you got problems here and I'm going to try to advocate and, and help you see the problems. If it's people that are leaving, they also are righteous. They are doing what they feel is best and trying to resolve conflicts in their life. Yeah, we are all unified in an effort to prevent triage. Our, our goal is, to, is very similar. We just want people to be healthy. We want, we want people to be happy and to thrive, not just survive. I want them to thrive. Kyle and I are at different points in our life. I mean, in how our life has turned out. I like Kyle. I hope Kyle is my friend. I mean, we have some differences, but there is way more similar about us. I have a husband. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. That's our difference. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'm very happy for you. And I think that's the beauty. That's, that, is the, that is the relationship that you and I can have. And I think that that is not unorthodox. That is what we all should experience. I want you to be authentic, and I want you to accept me as Likewise. my authentic self. Likewise. Yep, I absolutely believe that. See, we are. Maybe we're going to do some good. <laughs> Perhaps. David, you again, do lots of good, so I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, I, I absolutely appreciate the time that you were able to give um, to the podcast, to this episode, to the community, to uh, the, fa the communities of faith that you uh, participate in. I, I fully support and, and continue to champion your efforts on that side of the aisle as well. Thank you very much. I don't, I don't seek any attention. I, I never asked to be on podcasts. I never asked to meet with leaders. But this is the mission I was given, and, and somehow God keeps making these things happen. And we'll call it forced free agency because I told him he will be here. <laughs> yes. You asked quite forcefully several times. <laughs> and, and he complied. So I'm, of that, I'm grateful. <laughs> thank Again, you, Kyle. Thank you. David Doyle on Latter Gay Stories podcast. Thank you to each of our listeners and, and viewers who have participated in this episode. I want to hear your comments. If you are watching on the video version of uh, this podcast episode on Facebook or YouTube, let me have it. I'd love to hear uh, your comments um, about the episode, about um, David's uh, path forward, about each of our individual paths, and, and how this episode might have influenced you. If you are listening on the audio version of the podcast, as always, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and also to leave us a rating. If you do uh, subscribe to the channel, I will give you kind of a teaser. We do release the audio versions first, so you will be able to catch episodes like this ahead of the video versions, and that's uh, something we give to our audio podcast listeners. If you um, 
people always wonder where do I catch uh, the Latter Gay Stories podcast, and it's easy to say everywhere you catch your favorite audio podcasts. We are everywhere on Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Apple, Google, and all the podcast players. We, again, um, appreciate those who subscribe to the channel and those who share content like this. Sharing through social media does so much for the reach and the, uh, our abilities to build bigger and stronger bridges between these two communities to really come to what Mormonism has called the unity of faith. And I, I absolutely believe in uh, the sharing and telling of stories to help uh, normalize and create better visibility on this topic. And once again, I want to thank David for sharing his story and uh, the things that he's doing in his space to move the needle. The Latter-Gay Stories podcast, again, uh, is your opportunity to better understand these intersections, the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. It's stories like yours and mine and David's that help us each continue writing our own Latter-Gay story.